The two biggest train stations in New York City are only six blocks apart, but look like they are on different planets. One is an architectural marvel, and the other is a dump. Why is that? A train station serves one basic purpose, getting passengers to and from places. But Grand Central Terminal in Manhattan does more. It elevates you, presents you with elegance. Arriving from your local commute, one can feel inspired to make their day best, to take on a city. The terminal gives the chaotic New York City a noble sense of order. The golden clock in the middle marks the time, and the process of walking to and from a platform is made smooth and graceful. Six blocks over, another station stands. Penn Station infuses one with drab, grime, and melancholy. It suffocates passengers in confusing makeshift, dimly lit corridors. Commuters feel downtrodden and upset that their trains aren't coming on time. 600,000 people pass through Penn Station every, every weekday. It is the busiest train station in North America. But why is one station awesome and the other drab? Why does one inspire and the other frustrate? Once, this was different. For 50 years, a different structure served as Penn Station. With graceful windows and a towering ceiling, that space, the original Penn Station, served the people of New York. Magic flowed into the minds of citizens commuting through it. Like Grand Central, it made days better, eyes clearer, but just 50 years after it went up on 34th Street, it was destroyed. How could such an injustice be done to one of New York's foundational spaces? What led to this, and how is the city currently trying to rectify the mistakes of the past? This is why Penn Station and Grand Central are different. Back at the turn of the 20th century, the top American business was the railroad. Before the invention of flight and the popularization of the automobile, trains connected a vast nation between two oceans. New York was America's largest population center and economic hub, and in the railroad business, it was largely dominated by the New York Central Railroad, owned by Cornelius Vanderbilt. Another rail company, the Pennsylvania Railroad, based in Philadelphia, wanted to make an entrance into this city and challenge his monopoly. They did this by offering Vanderbilt Baltic Avenue and a get-out-of-jail-free card for Marvin Gardens. A completely fair deal that he totally should have taken, and this game is stupid anyway, how long have we been playing? At the turn of the century, Pennsylvania Railroad passengers going to New York City had to arrive at Jersey City and take a ferry along the Hudson to get into Manhattan. Ill. Led by CEO Alexander Cassatt and technological advancements, for eight years, workers of the Pennsylvania Railroad laboriously carved a tunnel out of the thick Hudson bedrock. Boring a tunnel from New Jersey into Manhattan along 34th Street, which trains could pass through. This tunnel st still serves passengers today. To mark the arrival from the tunnel, a grand station was built. The original Penn Station, opened in 1910, had a glass ceiling and metallic ornaments on top. Its Greek myth mythic architecture was adored by all passengers who used it. The plan and the opening of the station shook the Vanderbilt monopoly to its core. They still had the little red ones, but now the Pennsylvania Railroad had the little green ones. And everyone knows once you get the green ones, everybody starts landing on that stuff. Their New York City hub, the original Grand Central, was well hated. Hot, steamy locomotives streamed into tracks which were placed above the street. On a snowy day in 1902, 15 people died in a train collision at the station due to smog created by the steam trains. City officials begged for a solution, and chief engineer of the railroad, William Wilgus, thought of one. A new Grand Central, with platforms below the ground to block the smoke, an electrified rail to transition away from steam. Opened in 1913, Grand Central Terminal was on par with the mighty Penn Station as a tribute to New York in all its glory. For over 100 years, it has stood and looked largely the same. I work near Grand Central Terminal. Sometimes I take short walks there, and when you enter the main hall, it always takes your breath away. When you watch people, you can see some take pictures, look up skyward at constellations and be inspired, while others rush to their local commute. But no one is downtrodden. All are elevated in a beautiful dance of movement. By all accounts, the original Penn Station did this as well, made the simple act of arriving and departing from a train noble and graceful. When Penn Station and Grand Central Terminal were built, they were fully owned by their respective train companies. Slowly over time, both stations began to deteriorate. The train in America now had competition. After World War II, commercial airlines started to become a regular option for everyday Americans. In the 1950s, President Dwight Eisenhower signed the Interstate Highway Act, creating standards for safe roads all across America with easy signs to follow. Automobiles also began a huge increase in sales, as their domestic production had been heavily curtailed during the Second World War. 
drive a big new Plymouth Suburban. The America of the 1950s saw the rise of suburbia, where cars were used for their commute instead of trains, and planes for long distance due to their increased speed. This left the practicality of the locomotive localized to dense cities like New York, but left companies like the Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central Railroad losing money on a vast swath of midtown Manhattan real estate. Maintenance took a back seat, and advertisements were heavily placed throughout both stations. Finally, in the early 1960s, strapped for cash, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company decided to sell off a piece of Penn Station to a real estate project to build a sports arena called Madison Square Garden. There were some protests, but many city residents did not pay attention to the news. In 1963, a two-year demolition process began. Quote, Until the first blow fell, no one was convinced that Penn Station really would be demolished, or that New York would permit this monumental act of vandalism against one of the largest and finest landmarks of its age. The New York Times. When city residents arrived in the new Penn Station, they were shocked. Gone was the expansive view of the sky. The ceiling was now the legal minimum. Gone was the easy navigation. Now travelers had to find their way through complex tunnels to get to their track. In reaction to this perceived injustice, the New York City Council passed the New York City Landmarks Law in 1965. This would allow the city to mark a building, a historic site, and protect it from being destroyed. Its first major challenge came a few years later when the New York Central Railroad had a similar plan to that of Penn Station in the early 1970s to knock down part of Grand Central Terminal and build office buildings. The city blocked this real estate sale. The New York Central Railroad argued this was unconstitutional, a government to tell a private enterprise how to sell the real estate which they own. A lengthy court battle ensued, and the public sphere, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, wife of the slain president, publicly lobbied for the preservation of the station. In 1978, a decision was handed down by the United States Supreme Court. The New York City law was valid, and Grand Central Terminal could not be destroyed. The New York Central Railroad was now bankrupt, and the Metropolitan Transit Authority, run by the state of New York, took over. A long preservation project began, and today the station still has the same gleam that it did over 100 years ago. In 2013, Grand Central Terminal celebrated its 100th birthday. The PBS documentary on Grand Central tells much of the story that I just did, but it's longer and there are a lot of old people in it. But my favorite part of the documentary is these little vignettes they have about people and how they associate the station. A World War II veteran who said goodbye to his childhood friend as he got on a train to basic training, not knowing it would be the final time he saw him. A Chinese immigrant who visited the station as a young child with her mother, whose mother imprinted the idea on her that she would one day be one of the commuters rushing through the station, only to later have a commute where she would enter the same terminal every day and think about her parents' sacrifice. Or a young photographer, Boris Klapwalt, who loved to capture the terminal in the early 1950s. His photos were donated to the MTA and now stand in a gallery underneath the terminal. This space means something to so many. These large stations don't just take people from A to B. They connect people with themselves and past generations. So what about Penn Station? How is the city trying to bring the allure back? The most obvious example is the Moynihan Train Hall, named after New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan and finished by the MTA under Governor Andrew Cuomo in 2020. The space pays tribute to the old pen, with a glass ceiling and photos of the old one. However, it sits farther away than many commuters would like, and for Long Island Railroad passengers coming from the street subways, it's a little impractical. So how else is New York State planning on improving their two major hubs? In March 2023, New York City is supposed to open east side access to Grand Central, making the Long Island Railroad accessible to the east side of Manhattan through Grand Central Terminal. This project has been on and off for 80 years, and is supposedly just close to being done. There's also a parallel plan to give the Metro North passengers access to Penn Station, which the MTA's website says should be completed in 2027. The MTA is also improving lighting in the LIRR section of Penn Station. When I was there, there were some panels up top getting gutted and replaced, and there was more natural light than I'd ever seen in the station before. It's getting a little nicer. The two tunnels built by the Pennsylvania Railroad in the early 1900s were damaged by Superstorm Sandy in 2012. A long decade of haggling on who would pay the money to rebuild the tunnels has ensued. With Finally, the project has been approved in the 2021 infrastructure plan. According to the MTA, the tunnels will be completed by 2028. I mean 2038. Now, how did they figure these things out? There was recently a story that said it won't be 2035, it'll be 2038. How they rate these things, who knows? 
A more general plan is underway to redevelop the area around Penn Station, which has become somewhat seedy, creating new office buildings, wider sidewalks, and pedestrian tunnels between different subway lines around 34th Street. The last of the Penn revitalization efforts is scheduled to finish sometime before 2087 and 2092. It's a joke, but not really. If you read these documents, it says like 2055. New York City is always on the move and always changing. It's no wonder that the buildings that help residents get on the move have changed with them. Although Penn was destroyed, it was replaced with a Madison Square Garden that hosts Billy Joel and sometimes even the Nixon Rangers play there. The new additions may not capture the old majesty of the original Penn, but it makes you appreciate Grand Central Terminal all the more. Throughout both stations, no matter the design, the people of New York City roll through them every day, bustling with passion and vigor and giving life to the city of New York.